This is the final part in our series about identity. And in this part, we're going to talk about protecting your identity. Jesus followers have an amazing core identity, a solid foundation given to them by God that enables them to walk with confidence and direction in a world that is broken and even hostile to our faith and to our God. But Jesus' followers' core identity is often threatened by two identity disorders, the first of which is identity amnesia. Identity amnesia occurs when we forget who God says we really are. Now, that forgetting could happen, literally, like we could actually forget it. But more often, that forgetting takes the form of just not reinforcing, not remembering, not taking proactive steps to, to tell ourselves once again who it is that God says we are. The second identity disorder is identity replacement. And this happens when we replace our core ID with a different ID, an identity that's not core, or something that's even contrary to our core identity. That's identity replacement. Now, these two identity disorders have disastrous results. Identity disorders such as identity amnesia and identity replacement result in a high risk of living without confidence. You walk through the world without the confidence that God intends for you to have. Or if you do have confidence, it's misplaced confidence. It's put in something other than who it is that God says you are. Identity disorders result in a high risk of living without purpose. A high risk of failing to make the difference that you were designed by God to make. A high risk of loss of eternal rewards that God himself would be so delighted to give to you on Judgment Day, but you just never get them because you don't do those things that God has set out for you to do. A high risk of a loss of sense of God's satisfaction with you. A life that is kind of characterized by as you walk through life, you're always wondering, like, what's the expression on God's face as he looks down with you? Is it satisfaction? Is it a smile? Is it a frown? What, what is it? Uh, these identity disorders result in a, in a high risk of becoming self-absorbed, of trying to make life all about you, your desires, your happiness, your pleasure, a high risk of being selfish, of mistreating people and loving things. These identity disorders result in a high risk of failure to develop and enjoy using your spiritual gift, a high risk of loneliness, because we have a, just a loss of close relationships and we never develop intimacy, that, that joy of being fully known and yet still fully accepted. Uh, these identity disorders result in a high risk of addiction and eventually a high risk of a crisis event at some point in life. And that's not the entire list, but it's a, it's a terrible list, a list of disasters. And so the point is this, since allowing your core identity to be supplanted by something that's not core is so dangerous, you want to do something to protect your core identity. I know you will. You, we, no one wants those things that I just read, those things that we greatly are at risk for if we don't protect our core. So you want to do something to protect your core identity. But here's the surprising thing. If you don't do something, God probably will. As I thought about it, as we were working through this series, it struck me that God takes our identity issues probably more seriously than we do. And I think that's because he knows just how serious this really is. And so God takes our identity issues very, very seriously. And if we don't do something, as Jesus thought, if we don't do something to protect our core identity, God probably will. So let's talk about it over the next several minutes. How do we protect our core identity? What will God do? What can we do? Let's start with God. God often uses pain to remind us of our true core identity. In her book, For Parents Only, Shanti Feldman gives us some insight into how to understand our teenager's world. And she includes this very helpful, it's very simple, but very profound diagram that she labels the identity circle. The identity circle has an outer ring, and along that outer ring is a listing of things that are often important in a teenager's world. Appearance, aptitudes, popularity, job, car, money, status, athletics, awards. And then in the center of the diagram is a small, solid dot. 
And that solid dot represents the core identity of the teenager. For Shanti's diagram, it has two parts, lover of God and beloved of God. When we talked about core identity, we added a few more things, right? Image bearer, lion tamer, body part. But let's run with what Shanti has here. She makes an important observation that if necessary, God will use pain in the outer ring areas to push us to the center, our true identity. Now, what would make that necessary? Well, if that teenager began to find life or look to try to find their life, their value, their identity in any one of those outer areas, their appearance, their approval, their awards or whatever, if, if they start to make that core to who they are, the, the source of their confidence, the source of where they're going to live out life, that becomes an idol that will destroy their lives and put them at risk for all the things we talked about a couple minutes ago. And so God, being the loving Father that He is, if He sees that happening, God will intervene. And He will go after that, that area of life or perhaps areas of life that are getting out of control and becoming core to that individual to push that Teen that he loves so much, back to their core identity, lover of God, not God, but beloved by God, right? The Old Testament character Jacob is a biblical example of this principle at play, and so we're going to look at his life in just a moment. Before I do that, though, let me just point out, this is a one-time event, and when Moses records the details of what happened in Jacob's life, Moses doesn't add a commentary at the end that says, and this is what you can expect God to do in your life if you live like Jacob. It doesn't end like that. Yet, Jacob's story, in the event that we're going to look at in just a couple minutes, carries amazing similarities to our own story. So that's why we're going to look at it. A bit of context for this event in Jacob's life. Jacob is the son of Isaac and Rebekah. He's the younger brother of Esau. And at a certain point in Jacob's life, he had tricked his dad into giving him the blessing that normally gets passed on from, from a dad to the eldest son. So Jacob tricked his dad and stole that blessing from his brother. And there's no way his brother could get it back. It couldn't be rescinded. His brother Esau was furious, wanted to kill Jacob, and so Jacob ran for his life. He, he ran to his uncle's house in another country. There at his uncle's house in exile, he fell in love with his cousin. And in those days, falling in love with your cousin was a good thing. It's not like today where that's a bad thing. And he made a deal with his uncle to serve his uncle for a number of years in order to have the right to marry his cousin. And he did that. Over the course of a new number of years, a number of possessions that had belonged or could have belonged to his uncle, and now his father-in-law, passed into the possession of Jacob, and tension grew between the two, and, and their relationship soured. And so Jacob, at a certain point, decided, you know, I need to return back home. And so he ran and left his uh, uh, father-in-law's house there. On his way back home, he gets word that his brother Esau is coming to meet him, but his brother Esau isn't coming alone. Esau is coming with 400 armed men. Jacob is scared, and rightly so. He has no idea what's going to happen. He just knows how things were when he last saw his brother Esau, and he knows that Esau is coming with 400 guys. And so Esau sent a peace offering to arrive actually in waves the day before that Esau would finally meet with Jacob. And, and Jacob's heart is hoping that Esau's heart will be soothed and pacified by this wave after wave of peace offering. And it's now the night before. Tomorrow, it's judgment day, doomsday, it's something he's going to meet with Esau. So let's pick up the story, Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two slave women, his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. 
It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he answered, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, he said, yet my life's been spared. The sun shone on him as he passed by Peniel, limping of it because of his hip. Oh my goodness, there is so much in the story, so many details, so much to look at. Let's just make a, observations of a few highlights. Jacob has spent his entire life wrestling to get a blessing. Years ago, he had done it with his brother. There was a whole thing with pottage to get the birthright. And then he wrestled with his father-in-law to get the blessing there. He wrestled with God at one point in his life. He tried to make a deal with God. God, if you do this, then I'll do that. And now he's wrestling physically with a mystery man that we find out later in the story is either an angel or God himself. In the course of that encounter, Jacob got asked his name and he admitted his name. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal to, you, or to me to, to admit who you are, to give your name. But when Jacob spoke his name, his given name, Jacob, he's doing more than just saying his name. He's admitting his identity. See, in those days, your name meant something. Your name was given to you as either a sign of your destiny or a statement about your character. Jacob was both, but more the second, a statement about his character. That name Jacob literally means heel catcher, or some would translate it supplanter. It has this idea of a person who's always behind, but reaching up, grabbing the heel of the person in front of him, trying to trip him up, and then take what that person has for themselves. It, it carries that idea as well of being someone who might cheat, someone who would usurp underhandedly, one who's always striving, always reaching, always grabbing, trying to grasp and get what they don't have. So when Jacob gets asked, what's your name? He says, Jacob. It's kind of sheepishly, but he's admitting this is not just my name. This is who I am. This is the kind of person I am. And during the encounter, the man changed Jacob's name. He said, from now on, your name's going to be Israel. Now, the exact meaning of that name, Israel, is unknown. We have a lot of ideas, but we don't know for exactly what it means. But we do know this for sure. It is an indicator of a brand new reality and a brand new destiny. Because when Jacob receives that name, he's also told, told you are one who has wrestled and overcome. It's as if Jacob's core identity is shifting in this moment. He's going from heel catcher, striver, always trying to catch up but never getting there, always seeking the blessing but never getting it, close but not quite, dishonest, all that is passing away, and now his new name is indicating that he is an overcomer. As Jacob walked the next day to meet with his brother, he was still nervous about that encounter, yet he walked with confidence because of the blessing that he got from this encounter the night before. He also walked with humility. This is a turning point in his life. Jacob was never the same after this particular encounter. And he, most Bible commentators believe that the limp that he had when he met his brother, he carried with him for the rest of his life. And that limp served as a reminder of the transformation that had taken place in his identity during that night as he wrestled with God. So think about that. I want to throw out just a few questions for reflection. If you were wrestling with God and he asked you your name, not your given name, but you had to give to God a descriptive phrase, a, a few words who told who you are, what name would you have to give? If you were being brutally honest, what would you have to say to God? Maybe you'd say performer. Yeah, I, yes, I, I'm always performing. I'm always, I'm always out there performing, hoping for applause, hoping for attention. That's really who I am, that core identity stuff. That's really neat, but really at my core, I'm a performer. Maybe you would say, I'm one who's afraid. At my core, my life is dictated by fear. I am one who is afraid. I remember... Years ago, I saw a church service where the pastor had people come out on the stage one at a time, and each one had a, had a poster in their hand. And on one side of the poster, it, it 
talked about who they were, just a few phrases, or words or a short phrase about who they were before they had a life-changing encounter with Christ. And then they would show that often with a sad face, and then they would flip the poster over and a giant grin would cross their face because on the other side of the poster was a description of who they now are. So, for example, maybe on the one side it said lonely, and then they would turn it over and it would say befriended. The next one comes out and says addict on the one side, and they flip it over, free in Christ, right? What about you? What would be on the one side? And then what name has God given to you? I know you're, if you're a Jesus follower, you're God's friend, but maybe there's something even more specific that really sums it up, who you are in Christ now, what transformation has taken place in your identity. If you had a poster, what would it say on the side before Christ got a hold and, and did his amazing transformative work in you? And what would it say on the other side that would make you smile? This is who you are now, the name that God has given to you. Another question. Has God used pain in your life to push you back to your core identity? Do you walk with a limp? <laughs> Something that is a reminder, an ever-present reminder of your identity transformation. Maybe you can't do what you once did. You don't have the capability you once had, but that's okay because that limp, that limitation is an ever-present reminder of the change in your identity that's taking place. Is God currently using pain to push you back to your core identity? And if so, will you accept it? Will you push back on him or will you let him push you back to your core identity, who you are according to God? While you're thinking about that, I'll share a bit of my story of God using pain to push me to my core identity. Back in the years before we moved to Portugal, all that stuff about my core identity was true. Right? I, I was an image bearer. I was a lion tamer. I was God's friend. I was a body part. All that stuff was true because God says it's true and God made it true. But there was another part to my core identity, another thing that I was living for, uh, another part that I would say was really core to who I was. It described not just what I did, but why I did what I did. If I had to grab a sheet of paper and write out my descriptive phrase, my name, it would probably be this, productivity addict. I wasn't just a person who wanted to accomplish a lot. I didn't just have a, a to-do list with some check boxes I checked each day. I did all that, but it was more about that. I, I, was, I was evaluating at the end of the day, not just how much got done, but my value and my worth was being determined about how much I got done. And underneath all of that, the reason I was so addicted to productivity was a deep-seated insecurity and fear. That if I didn't produce enough of value, turn out enough lessons, help enough people, counsel enough broken or hurting people, show up at enough events, do enough things, then, well, you just wouldn't like me. And if you didn't like me, then I did, wasn't going to have value in your eyes. And if I didn't have value in your eyes, I didn't have value at all. And so I was a productivity addict. A couple of things happened shortly before we went to Portugal. Uh, one was God gave me a verse. I was reading in my normal devotional pattern one day, and I came across this interaction between God and Moses. And in Exodus 33, 14, God said to Moses, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And as I read those words, it was like they jumped off the page as if God was saying to my spirit, Andy, this promise that I gave to Moses, I'm going to give to you when you get to Portugal. I'm going to go with you and I'm going to give you rest. And I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I knew that sounded great because my life could be described in a single word in those days, pressured. It was always pressured. So rest sounded absolutely incredibly wonderful. Second thing that had taken place was we had these brainstorming conversations, dreaming conversations with the Portugal missionary team. And in them, we talked about the things that we perhaps could do. They had looked at my resume 
And they had looked at the things that they'd been praying for and the needs they had in the field. And they thought, man, there's a great fit here. Andy and Mar are going to come. We're going to do these things together. Andy's going to bring this value to the field. And so I arrived in Portugal with, you know, my five words of Portuguese that I knew and this promise from Exodus 33 and these high hopes of what it was we were going to do. And those hopes got shattered quickly. You can't do a whole lot with five words. And I went uh, from having a productivity, let's say it was up here, maybe at 100 to zero, like overnight, when you don't know the language and you don't know the culture and you aren't trusted or respected there, you can't do much by way of ministry. And so all that stuff, I thought, yeah, we're going to go and we're going to do this and this is going to happen. Boom, I wasn't doing any of that. And I went from 100 to zero overnight. And then shortly after that, as if that wasn't enough to rock my world, because my world was rocked. The next wave was this, the realization that before I came, the Portugal team was producing a certain amount, right? They, had, they were doing a certain amount of ministry, but now some of those people were leaving their ministries. They weren't doing as much as they were doing before because they were trying to help us. They were teaching us the language. They were helping us find a place to live. They're helping us find a car. They're trying to teach us the culture. They're helping us get the documents we need in order to live there. We're fighting with the, the visa office and on and on. So the total productivity of the entire team, when you add it all up, like just how much we're accomplishing didn't go up with me being there it went down it went down we were getting less done as a team because I was there I wasn't just useless I was less than useless I was a drain on the productivity of the team as a whole and so my identity went from productivity addict to less than useful less than useless to say that that was painful be a huge understatement It'd be like saying King Kong's a big monkey or something like that. I was broken. I was in pain. God was mercifully but ferociously pushing back on this part of my life that had taken over this non-core, actually contrary to my core identity that had taken over my core identity. And over the months, perhaps years that followed, a transformation took place. As God slowly but surely convinced me that, Andy, you are not just a producer. You're a person. You're not a producer. You are a person. And God confirmed that my worst fears were right, that I was no longer producing things that other people valued. And because I wasn't producing things that other people valued, I often didn't get invited to the table, so to speak. They didn't get a hold of me and say, hey, Andy, hey, we want you to be part of this project. Hey, Andy, why don't you come over? Hey, Andy, give us some thoughts on this. Give us your feedback. Give us your advice. That didn't happen. God confirmed that that was what I was afraid of would happen. Did happen. I didn't get invited to the proverbial table, but that was okay because while I was not invited there, I was welcomed into the presence of the Trinity. So my identity shifted in those painful months and years, from approval addict to less than useless to welcomed by the Trinity. Another thing happened as we went through that. God kept his promise, and I found rest. God often uses pain to remind us of our true core identity. That's what God does. What can we do? Well, we can use physical things to remind us of our core identity. Jacob did that. He, he named the place Penuel. And for the rest of his life, anytime he went by that place, anytime he heard somebody mention that place, that's what went through his mind. That identity transformation that took place in his life, was he had a reminder. You and I can do the same thing. We can build things. We can put things. We can plant things. We can use physical things to remind us of who we are in Christ, who God says that we are. And finally, we can use habits to reinforce our core ID. That was the whole point of part four of this series. So here we are. We're at the end of the series. I, I want to just kind of fly back through some of the highlights of what we've talked about. As I'm doing that, I encourage you to just pause, reflect, maybe go to God and say, God, I'm listening. Is there something you want me to know? Is there something you want me to do? 
I'm listening. I, I encourage you to do that while I just hit the highlights one last time. We, in this series, we talked about knowing who we are matters as much as we all think it does, but probably not for the reason we think it does. We think it matters because we won't be happy and fulfilled and, unless we're aligned with our true identity, and that's probably true. But it also matters because we always live out our sense of identity. And so if we get our identity wrong, that'll result in living life wrongly. We talked about the options for determining our identity. We can get our identity vertically, look to God and say, God, you tell me who you, I am, and I'll affirm that. We can look to get our identity horizontally through our roles, through our performances, through the tribes that we run in. We can look to find our identity internally by paying attention just to our preferences and try to create our own identity. We talked about four parts of every Jesus follower's core identity. And we said that at your core, you're an image bearer. You're a lion tamer. You are not God, but you are God's friend and you're a body part. We talked about the connection between identity and habits. Today, we talked about how to protect your identity, how to keep the main thing the main thing and not let your core identity get displaced by the non-core things or something that's even contrary to your true identity. And we reflected on some questions about who God says you are and how God often uses pain to push us back to our core identity. This is my sincere prayer that you'll reflect on these things and you'll say to God again, God, I'm listening. Is there something you want me to know? Is there something you want me to do? And that you'll do that. And as you do that, great things will happen. And you'll walk away with a stronger conviction about your core identity, affirming who God says you are. And as a result, you'll walk through life with confidence and direction and a strong sense of God's presence with you. Amen.